Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about something a little bit different. Before I became a law professor, I was a portrait painter. I painted oil paintings on commission. This is one of my paintings here. And as you might imagine, in order to be paid to do this, I had to learn a couple things. I had to get some instruction. I had to learn how to use my eyes. I had to learn how to see. Now, um, law professors don't typically learn this in law school. It's not part of what legal education sets for itself as a goal. And yet, more and more, we're being asked to include visual tools in our teaching. Uh, Professor Ritter actually set this up for me perfectly and really laid out the case for why we have to take the visual landscape of the classroom more seriously than we have in the past. Now, some of us may have, in fact, already responded, many of us have, responded to this imperative. Maybe we've put some PowerPoints into our repertoire and we didn't have them there before. Um, maybe we've even realized that we have to put some images in those PowerPoints to really leverage on their impact. But uh, what I want to talk with you about today is the possibility of thinking more broadly, there goes the microphone, um, more broadly about what we mean when we say visual tools. And also, I want us to think a little bit about what we're placing in front of our students' eyes. So what do I mean by that? Visual tools is everything from our syllabus to our handouts to what we write on the whiteboard. All of these are visual tools. We communicate visually right now. Even if you don't use PowerPoint, you're communicating visually and it's so powerful. That communication is so powerful in part because we can't avoid it. Unless you close your eyes, that's going to come in. There is a message that's going to be sent by your visuals. So like all good uh, lawyers and well-trained law professors, we should care about that message. We should want to connect it with what we're actually hoping our students are going to do and what we're going to be uh, doing with them. So, oh, before I uh, move on to talking to you about some of the tools that visual artists use to sort of see the landscape, I'm going to say that this is not going to be a PowerPoint tutorial. I um, actually don't like PowerPoint that much. I'm not that good at it. Many of you are clearly much better at it than I am. Um, but what I do know is I know what I see. I, when I walk into classrooms and I see visuals that, that aren't, they're not doing what I think they could do. Um, it, uh, it makes me realize that we could all be better. We could all be more visually literate. So I'm hoping at the end of my talk that you're going to walk out of here seeing just a little bit differently. So I'm going to start with color. Every beginning art student learns that color falls on a spectrum between warm, so that's your reds and greens, uh, sorry, reds and oranges and yellows, to cool, blues, greens, purples. And there's also a spectrum of color saturation. So on the one hand, you can have colors that are highly saturated with a lot of pigment, really bright and punchy, all the way down to colors that are sort of drained of their pigment and very pale or desaturated. Now, in art school, you learn that if you uh, want to create space in your image or whatever it is that you're creating, you'd be well advised to put the cool, desaturated colors in the back and the warm, saturated colors in the front, in the foreground. Check this out. This is actually because of, it works because of an actual optical uh, illusion. When we look at items on the horizon line, they tend to be cooler and desaturated, just as you can see in this image. Now, once you start looking for this, you're going to see it everywhere because it's just a, it's a phenomenon. Objects in the distance are drained of color and they're cooler. So you might say to yourself, well, what does that mean for me? Well, <clears throat> um, now I'm going to talk just a, a, for a second about this idea that, uh, per, uh, that Daniel Kahneman, who's a psychologist, he uh, wrote about this idea in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Some of you might have uh, read it. He talks about this idea of cognitive ease, that the brain actually takes in information more readily, more fluidly, and processes that information 
uh, uh, with greater proficiency if the brain isn't distracted by other stuff. So if you show something that is clear, familiar, recognizable, it's going to pass straight through whatever um, uh, blockers the brain might have and be received more readily. So what does this mean for you as a law professor? Well, if you're choosing between colors, right? So you want to decide how you want to arrange something, even if it's just in PowerPoint or some other, um, use some other visual, you might, to take advantage of this notion of cognitive ease, want to choose colors that seem familiar, that seem clear, that don't seem distracting or otherwise uh, disorienting. So, with respect to these, one of these follows the warm, cool uh, paradigm that I was just describing to you, and the other one doesn't. You know, you might, for example, you might decide, oh, I really like the, the one on the right just because it's so punchy. That's perfectly fine. But if what you're trying to do is take advantage of this idea of cognitive ease, then the one on the left might be slightly preferable. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about line. Another thing that uh, art students learn, right? Well, what is font, actually, but a collection of lines? Font uh, is, uh, fonts collect lines, various thicknesses, various weights. And what we're doing when we decide to choose a particular font is we're making a decision about the aesthetics of what that font looks like. So <clears throat> here are a few examples. And interestingly, that at the top is not Apple Chancery. Um, it's actually a decorative script, so it kind of looks kind of curvy. Doesn't show up that way on this uh, screen for some reason. But you should know that fonts have actually quite famously sort of personalities. The curvy ones are sort of like whimsical. The square ones are sort of cold and geometric. The old fashioned ones are sort of serious. So when you're choosing between fonts, think about that message. Think about what you're communicating with that choice. But it's also not about that. It's also about the weight of the font. Heavier, thicker fonts. What does that communicate? Substantialness, right? If you're putting in a, white, a light font, it communicates insubstantialness. The size of the font. I would actually submit to you, I'm not going to get into the big sans serif serif debate here. I would submit to you that, um, that the operative uh, question is really about size, not about that choice. Because if, again, you're going to leverage those cognitive ease principles, you're going to want to go for readability. And readability is often more dictated by size than by serif sans serif. Lastly, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about space. Because all visual artists, photographers, painters, digital designers, think about where they're going to put their marks in space. Photographers often employ this rule of thirds that's illustrated up here on this slide. So what does this mean? It's very simple. You just take a picture plane and mentally divide it into thirds, both vertically and horizontally. So like draw imaginary lines in your mind. And at the intersection of those lines, those are called focal points. Those are places that your eye tends to go in a rectangular picture frame. So if what you want to do is create emphasis or interest, you'd be wise to place that item at those focal points or along those lines of intersection. A related idea is about uh, whether an object feels settled in space. It's not cognitively easy for us to look at this and not think that it just wants to sit down and rest. <laughs> you know? That uh, square is jumping around all over the place. And if what you want to do is make documents that are free from cognitive distraction, you're not going to want to put something that's jumping around like that. Similarly, the triangle on the left wants to resolve to the triangle on the right. The triangle on the right has three equal sides and it's very solid on itself. Communicates a sense of stability and symmetry and harmony. So I'd like you to start thinking about what you produce in your law school classroom as little works of art and start scanning them for where you can find places that they could be made more harmonious, more cognitively easy. In the course of that, don't forget that white space really matters. So in this image, obviously, you could see this as two faces, if you're looking at the black as the, as the foreground, or you could see it as a vase if you're looking at the white. 
We already employ this idea when we do things like set margins for ourselves. Like we're using white space when we edit out orphans and widow lines, that kind of thing. That's all about using and thinking um, with white space. So in the future, we already know we're not going to put a lot of text up on our slides, right? I didn't talk about that, but we know that this kind of slide, which is one of mine from a while ago, um, <laughs> isn't really going to uh, advance the learning process very much. But what I want to do, I hope you do, is I'd now like you to look at your slides as, as works of art and think to yourself, also a very hideous slide, right? Is there a way that I could use color better? Is there a way that I could think about line better? Is there a way that I could organize the space better? And I hope, my hope, is that in the course of this, that you're going to not only honor the inner artist in you as you make these adjustments, but you're also going to make uh, more beautiful things. Thanks. Thanks.